Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Wingman Podcast. I'm your host, Todd Helms, and today I have Dr. Michael Chamberlain from the Warnell School of Forestry, Terrell Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management. Doctor, I got that pretty well straight? Yeah, yeah. You got All it, right. Todd. All right. Well, I appreciate you jumping on with us today and we're it's Turkey time. Everybody's getting fired up about gobblers and Turkey season is right around the corner. Florida's open. Uh, some of those Southern States are going to open up here shortly. Um, out here in Wyoming, we just got the announcement yesterday that our season has been pushed back to the 20th of April, running it through the end of May. There is one zone that is staying open around April 1st. Um, because of their, because of Turkey depredation on private property. And they want to try to thin those numbers out and shoot those birds when they're all flocked up. But, um, I, first of all, how do you, how do you like to be called Dr. Michael, Mike, Dr. Chamberlain? What, what do you want me to call you? Just, just Mike is fine. All right, just Mike, Mike. It, it, we got it. Well, your areas of specialty are wildlife ecology and management game management um, non-game and endangered species, wildlife forest management, wildlife population genetics. Um, you have a literal library of projects and papers and articles that you've written or partnered on and done work on of across a, a wide range of topics. But we're here kind of today to talk your take on turkeys. Um, you've had, uh, I'm very thankful that, we, that you were able to jump on with us, first of all, because I've listened to you on several other podcasts and was always like, man, if I get the opportunity to have Mike on, it's I got to make that happen because it's you're always entertaining. And I the first one I think I heard you on was the Meat Eater podcast and you were it was eye opening. Some of the stuff you were talking about, I was like, wow, I don't think a lot of people think about think about the things the reasons our turkey seasons are set the way they are and the reasons we hunt the dates we hunt because of turkey biology and turkey behavior um can you shed some light on that for us what are some of the things that you've studied and found and yeah 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 um yeah so i've been studying wild turkeys for about 28 years now um did did my graduate work on wild turkeys and i've been in academics now about 20 gosh 20 21 years now and have studied this bird ever since i was a graduate student up through today and you're um, in and you're in georgia correct yeah i'm i'm a faculty member at the university of georgia yep. most of my research has been in the east and southeast i've done i've done a little bit of work with rios in texas and and some work with goulds actually in in arizona um, but most of my work is, is on Easterns by and large. Um, yeah, the topic of hunting seasons, man, <laughs> that's one of the, uh, that's one of the most contentious kind of polarizing topics in the Turkey world. It really is. People get, people get pretty cranky and upset when it comes to, um, uh, you know, their, their abilities and opportunities to go and, and hunt and, so yeah, I get a lot of questions about season frameworks and why they're set the way they are and, and what they mean. And it, it varies a lot, as you know, I mean, you, you're out West, things are a little different as far as hunting pressure and, and the amount of activity that, are, that occur in some of the Western states versus here in the East. But, but the bottom line is that we'd like to hope that turkey seasons are mostly set based on biology but in reality, in many cases, they're not. They're, they're simply based on politics and social pressures to, to have hunters, us. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a passionate turkey hunter, and I, I want to be a field when I can hear birds gobbling. I mean, that's, right, that's right. when we want to hunt, you know. And so pressure from, from folks like us that want to hear birds kind of pushes agencies to open seasons earlier and earlier. And what that's caused is, for the most part, across the United States, most seasons open earlier than they should based on the biology of the bird. Um, 
and that's not just an eastern issue that that's common out out west as as well i've seen we were kind of talking about wyoming changing their regs um before we just yesterday they made an announcement that they're pushing season date back to the 20th and uh april 20th and running it through the end of may um for a couple different reasons but one of those things that one of the reasons that they talked about was to to not be hunting those birds during their peak uh nesting cycle or uh, you probably have the correct term for it but basically trying to let those birds do their thing before we start pounding them and taking toms taking dominant toms especially out of the breeding mix and can you shed some light on on some of that why why should we be hunting birds later yeah so the scientific world is has known this for for decades that the bottom line is um we've known through the years that the most conservative framework for hunting turkeys would be to time the removal of toms with peaks and in incubation and nest incubation. And what that means is wait until most of your hens are on the nest. And at that point, start removing toms because there's some percentage of them that are expendable that can be harvested without any detriment to the population. Sure. Um, so the thinking has always been, well, let's time seasons then. But as we just talked about, most states open before that time um and i think in many cases the reasons that many states are now starting to evaluate their season frameworks is because things have changed relative to wild turkeys in many portions of their range and populations are have either stabilized and are declining or in or in other situations states simply realize that that perhaps there are there are more sustainable ways of, of setting up harvest regulations. So they are making these little tweaks like you, like you just mentioned. And, and, um, and that's, that's a positive. I mean, that particularly if it's based on science, then, then I see those changes as, as being positive uh, for the bird. But yeah, we've known, we've known for years that, that it's important to let this bird go through its mating cycle before you start really tinkering with numbers of toms. And, and the reason behind that is pretty simple. This bird uses dominance hierarchies that dictate every aspect of their life. So turkeys are hatched and, and right after they're hatched, they start forming these pecking orders, these, these dominance hierarchies that all of us turkey hunters see in the field. Right. We, we see them fighting with each other and and testing each other and they're supposed to do that and those those dominance hierarchies end up putting a dominant bird at the top of each pecking order for both toms and for hens so both sexes have their own pecking orders and those pecking orders dictate who breeds and who breeds when so there's dominant birds in populations that are primary breeders and there are other birds in populations that are not primary breeders and we're not exactly sure who all these turkeys are. So the thinking has been for, for decades, well, just kind of wait, you know, and let the bird go through its mating cycle. And then again, at some point when, when the hens are starting to, to nest or a less conservative approach would be when they start to lay eggs. But the bottom line is let them start doing their nesting behaviors and then start taking toms out. That's kind of been the the framework that was recommended to agencies many many years ago. Well, that's that's interesting you say that because it's the little bit of reading, not little bit. I've done quite a bit of reading actually, but it's all it is that right there in a nutshell that you're that you're talking about. That I I read it and it's been, but it seems like that knowledge was there, but like you said, the social pressure to get the maximum experience out of your turkey hunts kind of it's a balancing act it's it's you gotta their agencies are juggling those things and i remember when i first moved to wyoming that season seemed like if i remember correct our season was open statewide april 1st and i could be wrong there it just seems like that way 
And my goodness, what we saw for turkey behavior on those times was those birds were extremely aggressive. They were still feeling out pecking order. I mean, that that at that time, they're in big groups, you know, Miriam's groups hunting them on private property and pastures where they're still flocked up from winter, where you might have 150 to 300 birds all using a ridge, the same ridge to roost on, flying down, and they immediately go into establishing dominance and pecking orders when they hit the ground. And if you put up a strutter decoy, you couldn't keep the birds off it. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly, it seemed like just looking at fans and things like that, that they weren't, that they were younger, like two-year-olds, two-year-old type birds, had a little bump in the back of their fan and, and not, anyway, but it was amazing. I mean, there was, I remember one hunt in particular that we could have probably limited out as many people as we could have rotated in. We had, I think four tags, we killed four birds and never got up, never stood up. The birds just kept coming. And then you know, birds are, you shoot a bird and it's flopping around. Well, that just attracted more attention and they were just, but they would immediately just gravitate to that strutter decoy and just want to pound on it. Yeah. And yeah. what I've noticed later mm -hmm. in the year, my brother who lives in Iowa, he hunts with a strutter the whole season from the beginning to the end and has great results. Well, what I've noticed out here on a lot of our birds is that by the time, say I'm hunting, I usually don't start hunting seriously until four pub, because we like to hunt public land. A lot of those birds, like I said earlier, they're flocked up on private and there's sometimes there's not a lot of birds on the public land. But by later April and into May, they've dispersed, spread out, and there's birds everywhere. So there's more opportunity. And I think that's what some of the state has recognized as well, is to spread that opportunity out as birds spread out and disperse mm -hmm. into their into their summer, late spring and summer range. And the strutter decoy out here doesn't seem to be as effective. A lot of you'll still get birds that then I mean strutter decoy, even even a uh, posturing Jake decoy, like a half strut Jake or doesn't a lot of birds will come out, take a look at it. They'll come to the call, but they'll come out and they'll take a look at that decoy and they'll see it and their body language changes 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. their the color of their head changes and they put their they kind of come out of strut change their attitude and they will turn to a 180 and walk away they will not uh -huh. commit in the last three seasons i've had one bird see the decoy and he came and charged it and i think he i shot him pretty quickly but i think he would have strutted around that decoy and probably attacked it but the last the last three birds that i've had react to that decoy that we've killed came into range called them came into the calling saw the decoys got to the point where they could see them and didn't want anything to do with them it was, it's yeah. been, it's been very, very interesting to see what, what's yeah. your, what's your take on that? Well, you know, the bottom line is we use decoys to try to get, whether it's for turkeys or ducks or geese or whatever. I mean, we're obviously trying to, to elicit a response and get a bird to do something that they otherwise would not do. So in the, in the turkey world, you know, if you, if you look at a decoy from a Tom's perspective, take the hint out of it but if you just kind of look at it from his perspective early in the season and when I say early in the season I mean early in his in his season in his biological season right, right. Um, he is wired and testosterone levels are increasing you know I'm, I'm sitting here in in central Georgia right now and our birds are gobbling their heads off as they should be right the season hasn't started yet they're not mating per se they're they're fighting they're displaying they're trying to attract attention and these birds are wired to compete with each other because they're trying to one up one another and get to the top of that pecking order knowing that that's what dictates their reproductive success you need to be at the top or you need to be associated with with birds at the top otherwise you don't you don't really stand a chance of being a primary breeding bird in that population. So if you think about it from their perspective, they see a decoy early in the, in the breeding period and their natural instinct is to attack it because it's some, it's a bird 
that's testing their dominance. Sure. It's, and that elicits a very aggressive response. And then you fast forward a little bit farther into their mating kind of cycle and you realize that at some point his testosterone levels start to 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 down you know to trend downward because a lot of your hens are starting they've, they've split off they've gone into the areas where they're going to nest they're either laying or they're incubating and you start to see these testosterone levels kind of wind themselves down and birds become less aggressive towards one another and then suddenly when the season's over you know these toms get right back together with each other as right. if they didn't as if they didn't despise each other right six weeks before. right um so it really you know the way a bird responds to a decoy really makes sense based on what you i mean what you just said is something i've heard a lot of people tell me is you know what and i've seen it myself you know i've I've seen birds come to a, a decoy early in the year and just go nuts. And then three or four weeks later, that same decoy, same setup, same situation, bird approaches, won't come anywhere near us, uh, spooks at 80 yards or turns around and walks off because they look at that situation and biologically, they're just not wired the same as they were a few weeks before. Right. So you don't get the same response. That's super interesting that you say that because that's last year's hunt that we just we just dropped on YouTube. Um, two very different, two very different deals. Got in on a bird the first afternoon, and ha literally had to sweet talk him like an eastern bird. And our Miriam's birds are like they usually it, it's fifteen minute deal. If you can strike a bird, get in close and work him, he comes. Mm -hmm. and this bird was like hunting in eastern where i grew up back in michigan where it was like it took an hour and a half to call this bird in and it got to the point where very little calling just scratching in the leaves making little turkey noises and all of a sudden here he, he pops out in full strut and like i said saw the saw the jake decoy with the hen the lay down hen and turned and walked off well unlucky for him he walked out and he was already in range and <laughs> it worked mm -hmm. out but the neck the other op the other so we ditched that we ditched the ditched the jake decoy and we hunted the rest of the time with just a hen decoy and it worked you know the second the second we were able to get another gobbler um about a day and a half later and uh we were in his we got in the fly down area anyway and had the decoy a bunch of hens flew down first he was the and then he, he came down and there were four or five gobblers anyway, but we were able to get it done, but we had to switch that tactic. Mm -hmm. And if, I guess my point is, if you're not thinking that way, if you don't have that knowledge or you're not thinking that way and you're just doing the same thing all season long, man alive, because ever you, you see it on TV, you see it on YouTube where guys are sneaking in, you know, they're reaping birds with the turkey fan and the birds come screaming in They're They're worked up. That's exciting. That's incredibly mm -hmm. exciting. That's what everybody wants. But the reality of it that we found anyway is when we actually have time to go hunt later in these seasons, it's much more of a finesse game. And it's it's chess, not checkers. Yeah, I actually had a bird last year on a hunt that was about, I don't recall the exact date, but it was about when we reached our peaks and in nest incubation here in Georgia. So mid April. So sure. our season had been going for, for three plus weeks. Okay. And we set up myself, several friends set up on a bird knew he was headed in this direction, put a, a squatted hen with a Jake decoy beside her 25 yards down my gun barrel thinking here he comes and he did he followed the script flew down raising hell coming right to us and then all of a sudden he gets quiet as as you know as the, as easterns are subject to do oh man <laughs> and uh the next thing i hear is and he flies up in a tree about 80 yards from us and he stares at that decoy for over an hour he had us pinned down wow and we just i mean we couldn't do anything we just had to sit there and stare at this bird but he i know because i, I know what he what he did he saw that decoy before we could see him right 
Right. And he stood there and got quiet and really scrutinized that decoy. And then finally he decided, I need a better perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get up in the air. And that's what he did. And he flew up to where he could see that decoy set up and he could really pick it apart. And as soon as he got in that tree and realized there's something amiss here, he just sat there and he sat there and he sat there and we, it was a cold morning and we were underdressed and uncomfortable <laughs> and we were freezing our tails off. And finally it was like, you know what? We're just going to have to spook this bird. I yeah. mean, we're, yeah. we're just, it's, it's over, but I, I actually have talked with people on social media about that experience and have gotten messages from people, dozens and dozens of people that have had Easterns do the same exact thing. Really? I've had them fly up above the decoys to where they were, they could get a better perspective of what the decoy spread, if you will, you know, whatever, if, even if it was just a single strutter, they could get a better viewpoint and they just sit there and they pick it apart and then they leave. I've had a number of people tell me they, they had that encounter. That's interesting that you say that because now if I if I think back on hunts over the last well 10 years out here in Wyoming, I've had birds use the topography the same way where they don't necessarily have to fly, but say you're hunting in a canyon or along where there's some ledges and rim rock. I've actually had birds walk over to an edge and look down and stand there like they're in a tree, but they just have elevation of the land mm -hmm. on you and they can get a better look and they get quiet. And they turn around and they'll gobble the whole, they'll gobble going away from you. They'll gobble every time you call, they'll gobble. They're getting further and further and further away. They <laughs> yeah. made up, they made up their mind, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And like you said, you, the, the gig is up at that point and you might as well just call it. But that is, that is super interesting. How much, how much of that do you think hunting pressure plays into? I think pressure is huge. We, we see. So as part of my work, I, I do a lot of, research where we trap birds in the winter in fact we just finished our trapping season a few weeks ago we put gps transmitters on birds and we describe their their movements we get locations every hour we know where they're going we know what habitats they're using etc but we're also we're also collecting data on gobbling activity on, on our study sites where we, we basically have these recording devices scattered all over the landscape that, that hear, if you will, they listen constantly and they record all sound. And then we use software to go in and tease the gobbles out so we can provide agencies with a really good idea of gobbling activity. Well, sure. I say all that to also point out that we, we also GPS track hunters so we, we have done a lot of research where we give hunters a little GPS unit, they stick it in their vest so we can understand where the hunters are going. And what we see very clearly in this work is that this bird figures out, if they live, they figure out a way to deal with heavy hunting pressure. They, they figure out a way to move differently to not call as much, to call mostly in the tree and shut up when they fly down. They, they figure out ways to deal with pressure because at least here and anyone in the South East and East can attest to this. And, and I know it's a little different out West because I've, I've hunted a lot out in your area, not specifically in Wyoming, but sure, sure. But you tend to see pressure acts differently for Merriam's and, and Goulds and, and Rio's. But, but man, here, particularly on public lands, these birds are just, they're hammered with pressure from before the season starts with scouting and, and so forth until the very last day of the season. Right. For them to survive, they have to figure out a strategy to deal with you and I walking around and yeah. calling and doing all these things. And they demonstrated clearly in the data that they can do that. They figure out ways to deal with pressure. Give us an example. So one, one common thing we see is they gobble less. They, okay. they just, on, on really heavily hunted public ground, they just gobble less. They, they perceive the risk associated with you and I chasing them around and walking up under their tree and doing these things that, that are associated with 
with our passion, which is turkey hunting, well, they, they deal with that by not gobbling as much because gobbling attracts attention. So we see that. We also see that a lot of gobbling becomes restricted to when they're in the tree on the roost. So if you've ever heard people say, man, they gobbled in the tree and then he hit the ground and shut up. Well, we see that a lot. That's all the time. Yep. yep. Yeah, we see that a lot. We see situations where birds will gobble only a few times and then they fly down and it's ball game. We see that that in many situations, hunters, when they bump into birds, like when, when the hunter and the bird meet and the bird doesn't die, these birds have all sorts of unique ways to deal with that. Some turkeys head to private land and hang out for a while to, to get away from the pressure sometimes literally walk around us constantly and we don't even know they're there we see sometimes that shrink their home ranges some that enlarge their home ranges and the take home that we've kind of concluded is there's no such thing as an average tom sure sure they're all did they're all different they all figure out unique ways to make it work and if they if they're going to survive they're going to have to learn how to deal with us you know yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've said all for a long time, I've said killing a turkey is easy. Hunting turkeys is a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, if you just want to go out and snipe one with a 17 HMR on a, on a ranch someplace, that's easy, you know, but when you actually get mono a mono, tom to tom if you will and get after them man it, it can be so frustrating it can be so challenging they are what you're saying obviously we're wingman is tied to eastman's hunting journals that's our parent company so we're big game that is the eastman side of things all big game and the guys hate it when i say this but the turkeys and elk have so many similarities not only just in the way that because we hunt a lot of them. A lot of our hunting is based upon their sound during the rut, if you will. Um, but I have seen elk do exactly the same thing as far as vocalization goes, because they figured out, they know that the more they talk, the more susceptible they are. And there's times when they're going to bugle a lot more like early in the season, when they're, when they're splitting up big groups of cows, they're going to bugle a lot more than other times. Um, hunting pressure and predation in general plays a huge role in that. Um, and I'm sure there's studies that have gone on, but just talking to hunters, looking at what we see in the field, there's areas that we hunt that have high numbers of not only hunters, but have high numbers of predators as well. Grizzly bears, mm -hmm. wolves, that those elk are pretty quiet. Obviously the, you hear them quite a bit at night. A lot of the bugling will take place at night, which is the same in essence as the turkey gobbling in the tree because he's safe there. Well, they know from hunters, elk know they're safe at night for the most uh -huh. part. Uh -huh. And so that's when they get real active. Now we're also talking with crepuscular and, and lar can be largely nocturnal animals, but very similar behaviors, figuring out how to adapt to hunting pressure. And it's dynamic. It can be totally different from one bull to the next and like you said from one tom to the next and being able to recognize those things and adapt your hunting strategies now last year the the second bird that we killed on that on that particular video and our our hunting plans got shot in the foot last year with covid i mean sure, it was sure. kind of like you had multiple states and all these plans and it settled on wyoming that was all we could end up doing which was fine better than not at all but the second bird it was kind of like they were roosted in a pretty big group. All the birds that we could turn up on this section of public, which was an enormous section of public ground, but they were all pretty much roosted in one spot. And then they would go separate directions during the morning, during the day, they'd feed together for a little while in the morning. Then the hens would split off, do their thing. And the toms would just kind of hang out in a group together, but they would, you knew they were what they were doing, but they would drift off on the private, make a big loop. And then in the evening, they would come back to that roost spot on public. And I remember game planning with the, with the guy I was with saying, man, we can try to cut these birds off when they, as they're making their loop, let's, let's go run and gun some of the other pieces. We might 
you know, bump into a stray bird or whatever, let's stay hunting. But I think our best, best bet is we know where these birds flew down this morning. And I think we go in reverse and we sit and we're waiting for them. So that was kind of what we did. We hedged our bets. We weren't finding a lot of birds, so we didn't want to booger those ones. So we played it really conservative and we got in, got in early, went completely around in opposite direction, made a big long walk to get in there in the dark. And we were literally right where they wanted to be when they flew down. I've got, I literally first hand flew down and I just turned the camera on. And then it was birds flying down. They're flying down 15, 20 yards. Uh-huh. You know, they were, we were exactly where they wanted to be, but we had the advantage of watching them do it the morning before and being like, Nope, I'm not going to chase them. We're not going to be too aggressive with them because these are literally the only birds that we found. So we played it really, really, really conservatively and it worked. But instead of doing the same thing over and over and yakking away on the calls and being and going crazy, uh, the morning we killed that second bird, I don't even know if I called. We were just kind of, we were there in the right spot, put out the hen decoy by itself, and it worked. It was. Yeah, sometimes it's about being in the right place. That's for yeah, sure. you know, and I think, and I experienced, we experienced the same thing in Iowa a couple of years ago, hunting strictly pub or private ground um birds that were in either by themselves toms that were either by themselves or in pairs or threes and really not aggressive not not aggressive at all they gobble but didn't want anything to do like you said with that biology it was later in the year and they were willing to come to a hen but very cautiously and didn't really want anything to do with with a fight at all and really having to to rewire your brain, your hunt strategy around that and, be, and being flexible was the key to filling tags. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, the analogy that the comparison to elk is actually a, a pretty valid one. In, the guys, the guys hate it when I do that. They hate know, it when I do that. I know. <laughs> There's actually a, a really wide growing body of science showing how elk respond to not only hunting pressure from us, but also predation risk from natural predators. And that work clearly demonstrates that elk, like you said, they change the way they behave in response to high predation risk, whether it be from risk from humans or risk from from wolves or other species. And we're actually, we're doing some similar work now with turkeys. I have a, a doctoral student, Patrick, who's actually his dissertation is focused on this topic. And what he's trying to do is, is essentially describe how turkeys do that. Like we know now how elk do it. They, they become nocturnal, they shift to areas of their range. They do, they behave in a way that puts them in less risky places. Right. And we're, we're trying now to understand for turkeys. Okay. What does that look like for turkeys? So What does it look like to say a turkey moves to an area where it's less risky? Well, what does that look like? Where is that? What's the habitat conditions there? Is there a way we could we could replicate or better manage those areas where they they perceive the risk to be less? So they go there and lo and behold, they survive. What do those areas look like? Is there any way we can manage for those areas? In In other words, is there a way to take this this behavior this bird exhibits and use it to help inform agencies as to how to make sure we've got places where this bird can go and hang out because the risk is less, whether it be from us or from things that like to eat them, which unlike elk, you know, elk have a few natural predators, at least on adults, turkeys have a lot there's a lot of things that eat turkeys and eat turkey nests so the playing field is rich when it comes to predation risk but yeah we have we have ongoing work that's that's very similar to the work on elk you know it's interesting you say that because yeah elk don't have you know a skunk is not going to eat an elk calf unless he finds it dead you know a fox is not going to more than likely probably not going to be able to take down a raccoon for that example but man it's across the board you know out here literally everything 
everything from weasels and squirrels and ravens and crows are are predating on those nests to every animal and all the way up to when they're adults mountain lions bobcats coyotes you know everything will eat them yeah and it it's amazing it's amazing that any of them survive at all you know (laughs) one one of the things that that we see a lot out here is like i said earlier those they group up big time in the winter and they are almost found. Our turkeys out here are found almost exclusively this time of year on private property Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. where there's, they're feeding cattle there. There's, there's feed, there's cover. There's a reduced risk of predation uh, because they're close to human habitation. And there's a spot just to the East of us over the mountain range. That's got a ton of turkeys and the tags are like unlimited no no big deal but you have to be able to get on that private property because those birds those birds are especially early in the season they're almost exclusively found on private property in big numbers in big big numbers and they cause a lot of damage to haystacks and they you know they're they're not a rancher's favorite animal to have around you know so it's it's really interesting what the state has done by leaving that season open on april 1st and giving it even more extended time but by the end of the season you're looking for those birds up in the alpine you know up in the mountains i've been on spring bear hunts in may hunting at eight thousand feet and there's turkeys gobbling up there yeah yeah you know? yeah the issues out west are definitely any even to some degree in the northeast u.s where you've got kind of suburban type birds that end up creating problems for people. Right. There's not a lot of hunting activity in, in some of those areas. So you, you, you really do see this kind of dichotomy, if you will. I don't, maybe that's not the best way to look at it, but you have some situations where you, you know, we're really concerned about our season frameworks and our harvest rates and and what we're seeing in our local turkey flocks and then in other other situations you have almost an, an overabundant type situation where you have birds that are that are in it in situations where they're at conflict with humans and it, it does create challenges for agencies for sure beyond right. just the normal kind of day-to-day challenges they have and and that the one thing about the western subspecies in general is you tend to see that they do flock you know right. more than easterns and osceolas which tend to be in you know the 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 subspecies name for the eastern is basically you know forested bird so right you know, easterns and osceolas they hang out in areas where their visibility is not as as high they tend not to be as gregarious although they do flock I and mean, they hang around with each other those flocks are much smaller and you don't see as pronounced of a flocking structure in the winter as what you described, you know, there in Wyoming, where you've got a ton of birds in one spot. Here, they tend to be more, you know, more dispersed, still in pockets, if you will, but, but those pockets don't contain near as many birds. So we don't see those types of nuisance kind of issues that you, that you tend to see out, out west. Right. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, talking about dispersal and whatnot over the course of the season, a lot of it's food related, you know, the food is, becomes more available as spring changes it, you know, it changes with elevation out here. They call it right. The mule deer guys are studying the mule deer migration and ungulate migration, call it riding the green wave where those animals are literally following the green up spring green up mm-hmm. as it, as it progresses up the mountain in elevation our turkeys do the exact same thing where they'll go from guys are like, I got this awesome spot, man. There's hundreds of birds on this place. And I got permission. Sweet. You better be there opening day. Because if you wait, most of the time you'll go back and there might be a bird or two that has stayed behind and stayed there. And that's where they're going to operate out of. But the rest of them have, have spread out and they're everywhere. You know, you might take, 300 or 500 birds that are roosted pretty much. I know, I know one gentleman in Northeast Wyoming, I would bet you, I don't have, if you went and counted, I would bet he's probably got close to 500 birds on his property right now. Wow. Yep. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And by, I know personally a guy that hunts that later in the season and kind of 
does a mentor deal with kids on that on that ranch and he said man that ranch can be one of the most difficult places to find a bird in the end of april first part of may because they're gone yeah they're they're not there and you think oh this is going to be a slam dunk well if you're there on the opener it's a slam dunk or maybe the first week it's a slam dunk and then after that those birds those 500 turkeys are like they're a large number of the population for the entire area you're right and then they're they just go and they'll go 50 miles you know it wouldn't surprise me in that scenario if he's got birds that spend their rest of their year in south dakota across the state across the state line yeah there's good data on Merriam showing that you know those those suckers will move man they'll as things start changing with early kind of the onset of spring and vegetation green up those birds will move considerable distances a lot farther than we see easterns or osceolas or rios move i mean we we tend to see across all the subspecies that there is a shift from winter to spring where you sure you know, the winter flocks tend to start breaking up. They're in smaller groups. Those groups disperse across the landscape. But for most subspecies, that's there's not much of a, a shift, if you will. It's kind of like a pinwheel that wobbles. If you imagine spinning a pinwheel and it starts slowing down and it wobbles, well, this month they're right over here and then they shift over a little farther and then come summer they shift over but in reality, they're not that far from where they were two months ago. They just may have been off of your, you know, they're they're now on your property or and were not two months ago or vice versa. Whereas with Merriam's and, and Gould's to some degree as well, you do see these pretty dramatic movements where they may literally be on this mountain today and next week they're gone. Yeah. Completely gone. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think a large part of the prey species, a large across the board, whether, whether you're talking turkeys or mule deer, or elk or pronghorn or whatever, they all do that out here because they have to. Um, yeah. They have to for food wise, for habitat reasons. They have to kind of follow, follow the script, follow the, the role of the seasons. But I guess the whole point of that is uh, from a hunting perspective, is because you find birds someplace this time of year right now or even on the opener you know you've got permission and you can't get there for the opener you can't get there for a week week and a half those birds may or may not be there and you may need to be flexible mm-hmm. you know and that's and out here especially that thinking about elevation change is a big one you know following that snow that snow melt in the spring because those birds won't be very far behind it you know, and it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. It's, it's interesting to me to hear your perspective on that too. And kind of, I guess, affirm some of the stuff that I've seen and hear heard talking to other guys. And, you know, that's the whole point of being on here is to help guys be better turkey hunters in the long run. You know, if they can take list into this podcast and some of the things that you've said and apply those to their date, to their turkey hunts this spring, and be more successful you know that's kind of the point yeah i mean and and definitely you know as you as i'm sitting here listening to you i mean we know from a turkey's perspective i mean adults are eating they're eating plant material and insects that's kind of you know their spring and and to a lesser degree summer diet is pretty much plant material and insects if you think about it from their perspective, following green up, you know, this, this pulse of succulent vegetation, whether it be in Georgia or Wyoming, as the environment changes and you get that first pulse of green, that first pulse of, of life, if you will, that's when plants are putting maximum nutrition out. That's when those plants are more succulent. That's when they're going to attract more insects. So it, it makes sense. It, I mean, it's logical from a turkey's perspective that they identify those areas within their range, knowing that a range in Wyoming could be expansive versus, yeah. say, here yeah. in Georgia. But the bottom right. line is the pattern's the same. Go right. exploit areas where the prey is more profitable. And when the prey becomes more profitable up the street, go up the street. <laughs> that's the bottom line. Yeah, no, you're exactly that's that's exactly right so i you know thinking about that from a hunter's perspective you know having these things in your brain 
as you go afield and you start monitoring what's going on, okay, the birds don't seem to be over here, they're over there. Well, then over a couple of years of doing that, you start to be able to anticipate I'm going to hunt roughly this time of year. The weather's been about the same. Conditions seem about the same. It would make sense then that the birds are going to be over here versus where I saw them two weeks ago when I was scouting, you know, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, yeah turkeys, that's, that's phenomenal. Turkeys, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say turkeys. One thing that I think is important for hunters to understand is the way this, the way this bird's mating system works is they, they use a form of lecking as their as their kind of the basis of their mating system. No different, although it is different in in, in some ways than say a sage grouse or mm -hmm. prairie chickens, where you've got a bunch of males that are hanging out in a spot. Well, turkeys do the same thing, and you see that 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 behavior varies quite a bit from say easterns that can't see each other as far right. right to Merriams and other species, uh, subspecies that can. So you, you tend to see um, bigger groups of birds in, in the Western subspecies and smaller groups like we've talked about. But the bottom line is, you know, in the lecking world, and, and you look across globally across birds that use leks or any kind of derivation of a lek, which is just a spot from which a bunch of males are displaying, those leks stay in place year after year after right. year right and 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 that that consistency makes sense because if you're a bird that is adapted to going to places within your range or within your your area and you're displaying year after year after year and there's success to be had from going there in other words you personally as a you know as a male you're reproductively successful you're going to keep doing that so there's stability there. Those those same places that we see and we hear turkeys every year, there's a reason for that. And that is there's some type of environmental stability there. Otherwise, that lek wouldn't persist. That area wouldn't be as important to turkeys as it is. So if you have access to one of those places where, to your point, every year about this date, these birds start showing up, well, you have to cherish those places because for whatever reason though, you know, that is, is sometimes beyond our comprehension, that spot is important to this bird. Right. And if you are, if you own or hunt one of those places where for whatever reason, this bird ends up when it's mating, then you're sitting on cherished ground. You're sitting on yep. gold mine there. Yep. So do what you have to do to, to, to manage and conserve that place because for for whatever reason, that's important to these birds. And, and I you hear this a lot with hunters in the East, and I see it more pronounced in the West, but there's always turkeys here. There's always turkeys over there. And in, in subspecies like Rios, for instance, that don't have that many roosts in their home range, they may only roost in a few places. Right. That makes sense to me. But for Easterns and Osceolas that can roost pretty much anywhere they want, there's still places in their range, in your area, in your county, that are just money. There's always birds there, right. and there have been for decades. And those places, that's that those are important spots to turkeys and turkey hunters. No, I, I that is that's spot on. I when you started talking about that, I immediately started thinking of a spot that always had a gobbler or two or three in it back in Michigan when I was growing up. And it was like, there was always a bird there or a couple. And it, it didn't matter if it was April or August, you could go to that spot and there would be a Turkey there somewhere very, very close. And think about that too, man. Think about it. So let's say you went across 10 years and for 10 years straight, you always are going to hear a bird in that area, in that spot. But those birds aren't living that long. No, no. So the, you're replacing this local population, but these birds are ending up in the same roost spots, the same displaying areas, the same general habitat areas within that range. And they have been for decades. Right. There's something. That's, that's yeah, cool. It is. No, it is cool. 
that brings me to an interesting point that I wanted to talk about yours. I, I talked earlier about, you know, roughly two year old, you know, bird, obviously as a hunter in the field, we have ideas or we think we might have ideas as to how old the birds are that we're, that we're harvesting. But what do you see? What are you seeing for like maybe average age of bird harvested versus av- versus average life expectancy for a Tom? Cause hens, hens can live quite a, quite a while, but gobblers, yeah, yeah. gobblers usually, I mean, especially out here, weather plays such a factor into our birds that a lot of our, a lot of our Miriam's birds, they just don't live very long. You know, you're looking by the time a bird hits four years old, he's ancient because yeah. he's, he's had to escape hunter hunting pressure. He's had to survive predation. And then you throw in winters into the mix where I remember 10 years ago we had three harsh winters in a row and that spring hunting birds i was finding dead gob dead birds of all all makes and models underneath roost trees mm-hmm. they'd, yeah. fro- they'd frozen to death in in the winter time and fallen out of the tree you know and carcasses just everywhere underneath trees and our turkey numbers at that time we could harvest two toms in that area in wyoming and they immediately slashed it to one bird yeah, yeah. As the, and rightly so because our your turkey numbers just plummeted and yeah really- so we see we see about on average most toms if we if we ban them as jakes which we we banned a lot of jakes um we put a leg man on them if if they live to be about four they've done pretty well right um, most toms are killed when they're two so the the proportion that of the population that's three, four, five or older is 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 low, right? Because they don't live that long, um, which kind of goes to the point that you see in in a lot of states where you'll see their spring turkey hunting forecast, and they'll say, "Hey." It's going to be a tough year this year because two years ago we didn't have a really good hatch so there's not a lot of two-year-olds running around and it's going to be tough because these older birds are harder to hunt mm-hmm. you, know, you often see that in your in your turkey spring forecast you, if bet. you will. we do see some birds that live much longer than that we i one of my social media posts i think it was last week actually I talked about this where we do have some birds that will pop up and be eight, nine years old. That's not, as as you can imagine, that's not very (laughs) common, Um, but it does happen. And and earlier researchers noted they had, you know, they had birds that were over 10 years old that, wow. Which if you think about it, it's just crazy. What can you imagine what that bird saw over over there? I mean, unbelievable. I know. I I, I had, I had a bird that was nine that was banded as a jake and he was shot when he was nine so on a public hunting area oh my gosh there's no telling what that bird experienced in his life what he saw what he heard i bet you that turkey has heard every call that's known to man or woman oh yeah he's seen every tactic he's (laughs) um that's right so i got a story that goes with it with old birds I don't know how old this bird was. Obviously, I have to age it, but a couple of years ago, we went to Iowa, filmed a turkey hunt there, and it was tough. The birds were the birds were really tough. My wife ended up killing her first eastern bird on actually a walk-in area, private property, but enrolled in public that anybody could hunt. And we got it home, and bird had like, I don't know, 12 or 13-inch beard. He had almost two-inch spurs. And he was skinny. He was a skinny bird. He didn't weigh a ton, but he was just a big, big bird. And you know, your, your initial thinking is, man, that bird's old. That bird's old. And they, I think the only reason we we actually killed that bird was the the lay of the land allowed for he had to come into range before he could spot us. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. he uh, he was already in in trouble. And he had to come through a bunch of CRP, real thick, head high stuff. He'd step out into this little mowed strip and it was right along the edge of the woods. And we had the decoy there and same thing. He saw that decoy and he was like, nope. And he turned to leave and it was too late. You know, he was all, he was already in range and she made a good shot on him. 
But the point of that is, as I was breaking that bird down and cleaning him, I found three different size pellets and makes <laughs> pellets in that bird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She shot that bird with a with a uh, with a TSS load, and sure enough, I had you know found some of that. But then there was like fours that there was a, there was like a size four that was copper plated, and these are pellets that you're like the they're all black and they got scar tissue around them and you're digging them out after the fact there was another one that was a, you could tell it was a it was a um it was a smaller but i, I she might have been the third person to actually shoot that bird mm -hmm. you know and who knows how old he was but it was it was interesting to watch his behavior and to go back on camera because as soon as he steps into the open he spots either her which man she was she was pretty well hidden or he took a look at that strutter and totally was like, nope, not yeah. having it. And it, but it was just happened to be too late. It was, a uh, he was in the wrong position and we were smart about how we set up on that bird in particular, but I can't imagine over the years what that bird encountered and you know, what he's lived through, what he's seen. We talk about it in, in waterfowl circles all the time some of these resident giant Canada's that live 20 years. Oh yeah. And yeah. they are virtually by the time late season, February hunts come into play, they can be almost impossible to, to kill. Yeah. Because yeah. they have literally seen everything. These snow geese that live forever, you know, it shows when you have a bad hatch of juveniles, like you had in 2020, your hunting suffers where this year it seems to be pretty good. They got a good hatch of juveniles because that makes up 90% of their harvest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see the same thing with, with turkeys too, that looking at some of the, the spatial data we've gotten on these toms that were exposed to hunting, some of these toms adopt a strategy that they essentially do become unkillable. Yeah. They, we, had, we had some toms that, that hunkered down were repeatedly within shooting distance of a hunter the hunter never knew they were there wow um, they just hide yeah they do I, and we I, on one of these studies we actually interviewed the hunters as they were returning from the field and we'd ask them hey did you hear a bird yes or no you know kind of give us a log of your hunt right and then we would we would pair that with the data from their movements so they they had a GPS unit on them. Right, right. They would give us the unit back, and we would we would then pair what was going on. And we had several situations where this one particular tom was within shotgun distance of a hunter many times throughout the season. Holy smokes! And I, got, I, never, got, I never knew he was there. Nope, had no clue the bird was there, and that bird lived through the season. And there's no telling, honestly, how old that bird was. And, and maybe he was only three or four years old. But the bottom line was that bird had figured out how to play the game. Right. And he knew if you just shut up and sit tight, these guys and gals, they just walk these trails. They're not going to come in here and get after me if I don't tip my hand. Right. So I'll just live the rest of my spring out doing my thing. And then when – the season's <laughs> over. I'll go about my business. And that's oh what man, that's incredible. It's, it's incredible as you think, Oh, it's a Turkey, you know, he's heads that wide, you know, or whatever, but they figure it out. We had, that reminds me of a, again, going back to elk, uh, had a, an elk camp I used to be a part of. And there was a, there was a, you'd always hear bulls from the tent at night. You know, they'd come down out of their bedding areas and they would feed down through and you'd hear them around the tents and beyond at night. So in the morning, they're headed back up. And of course, we're racing to try to catch up with them. Well, at a couple of years in a row, it seemed like we we would notice coming when we came back up, came back down the trail, middle of the day, they, they all are bedded down. You don't mess there in thick cover. It's like, OK, let's go back, get it get lunch, get a sandwich, you know, whatever. There's days when you stay out all day if the conditions are right, but whatever. And on those days when we'd come back down the trail, you'd notice there'd be a, a single elk track in our tracks, <laughs> like in our boot prints. Yeah. yeah. And it was kind of, and then when it would snow, it would get even more ridiculous because it was like walking the same direction. Like literally, like, is that bull, is that elk following us up the trail? 
Well, it got to the point where it happened day in and day out. And I thought this is ridiculous. Let's take one dude drop, drop out and just hunker down and sit there off the side of the trail and wait. And sure enough, we didn't kill that bull, but sure enough, it was about 30 minutes after we left and walked up the trail. They that hunter said, yeah, that bull came by, but he couldn't, he was outside of bow range and kind of some thicker stuff, but he's like, he followed you guys right up the hill. Yeah. I had and a white I, tail do that one time. Yeah. Actually I had a white tail. I was hunting. I called him kicker. He had a, a huge kicker on one of his, his G twos that, that deer actually followed me to the stand one afternoon. And the only reason I caught him doing it, he was bedded near where I was having to park to get to this spot. Sure. And I had to go up a property line. So my options were limited and I had the wind perfect and everything. And I think he was close enough to the little access route I had that he heard me or he sensed me walk by. As I was climbing up in the stand, I looked back on my path and he was follow he was walking directly to me, staring in the direction of where I was climbing. He, that, that, he was doing that exact same behavior. And of yeah. course he, of course I tipped him off and I, I ended right. up not killing him. I ended up killing him the year after that, but, but that deer knew exactly what the game was in my, and maybe I'm giving him too much credit. Maybe he was just dumb lucky. <laughs> it sure seemed coincidental to me that as I'm climbing a tree, I look back and I'm literally on the path. I just walked. There's a 145 inch whitetail walking the path staring at me I, right. I just found that to be too coincidental no and I, I don't think it is i don't think it's giving them too much credit um we and i've heard the same story that the, the elk story different versions of the same type thing out here different guys you know we can a lot of times we can see pretty well out here so you'll get stories where man i watched a group of hunters working across this ridge and there was a bull elk following him. You know, he was a hundred, <laughs> hundred yards behind him, but he was walking right behind him. Keep it is like, and these are heavily hunted areas, you know, public pressure's high. The animals don't necessarily just vacate the premises. They just figure out strategies on how to survive. It's I mean, think about it. I mean, if they, in some situations, you know, these animals are living in under the constraint of having a home range. Right. So we see this with wildlife in general, but turkeys, for instance, they don't abandon their home range. Mm -mm. Even during catastrophic wildfires, flooding, they stay there. They just figure out a way to shift around and make it work. So, you know, we put the pressure to them. That jives with what our data have shown. Some of these toms just say, you know what, I'll just hunker down and deal with it. And I'll figure out a way to navigate around these people and make it work and get through the, the spring reproductive season and then I'll go about my business. And that, I mean, we clearly see that. That's uh, fascinating. It's fascinating. I turkeys have fascinated me since I was a kid and I grew up in an area in the, in Michigan, in the upper peninsula where we really didn't have turkeys, you know, there was, and I, I had, we had to travel to hunt them into the lower peninsula. And it seemed like it took me years to figure out how to actually successfully hunt turkeys and, you're still learning about the time you think, oh yeah, I got it all figured out. Then you get thrown a, a screwball and you're like, all right, back to the drawing board on that one, you know, but I don't know. It's, it's that challenge that you're always seeming to, like I said, about the time you think you got the game dialed and figured out the hand, the, the deck gets shuffled, you run across a bird that does something completely different. And it's just the challenge of it all that I don't know, just keeps you coming back. At least for me, year oh, after yeah. year after year you know and oh yeah that's what makes it fun absolutely you know, if, they, if it were if it were easy and you never got a curveball then at some point i think it would become i think it would become boring yes I, you know i i stomp my feet and cuss and raise hell when i encounter a bird that just literally seems like he's a demon <laughs> and and then at the end of the day i get home and, and and i think about it and i have to laugh i'm like you know what I, I've been doing this a long time. I've, I've studied this bird my entire career and that bird just kicked my can, you know, and embarrassed me. And, <clears throat> and it's funny. It's, it's funny. And it's what makes you, it was what drives you to get up the next day, the next opportunity you can and go out there and, and give it another go. That's what, that's what makes it fun. 
Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I, and that's, you know, we're looking at it this year and it's ramping up. It's about time and going, all right, where are we going this year? And what are we going to do? And, ah, oh, I just, I love it. I love it. I, I, re- I just can't get enough, but well, what are your plans this spring? I mean, you're probably obviously going to hunt home ground, but you going anywhere. You're going to travel anywhere and hunt. Uh, man, I, I really hope so. Um, <laughs> I had grand plans like everybody last spring and that got dashed, but yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm supposed to start in Florida here in a couple of days and I'm going to hunt, uh, in Texas. I'm going to hunt in Virginia a little bit. I, I actually grew up in Virginia. I'll hunt here in Georgia, of course. And, and, um, uh, also have a trip planned to South Dakota with some buddies. So so I'm going to try to make the rounds, which I usually do every spring. I, I love to travel and I love to go see birds do their thing in different places. And, and yeah, I'm hoping that, that everything holds together. Like I'm sure every turkey hunter is, and that we're allowed to do these things this spring. I'm looking forward to it. Just like you are. I can't wait. I I'm chomping at the bit. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Well, that's, that's really cool. And I appreciate again, your time today and you're a busy guy and I appreciate you sitting down for an hour more than that. Actually, I think now with us and, and just talking turkeys, man, cause I know it's your passion and it's something that, that I'm passionate about. And I think a lot of people are and, and, uh, yeah, it's exciting. And I, thanks again. I really appreciate it. And any last words of wisdom for people that are listening? No, not really. I mean, my word of wisdom, I think, would be if, be patient. Be patient. Um, that's that's a wise man told me many, many years ago who was a really good turkey hunter that, hey, if you want to leave, if you feel like getting up and leaving now, wait five more minutes. Yeah. And if you can wait five more minutes, wait 10. <laughs> and if you can wait 10, wait 20. And his point is still, I think, apropos today is every second you're out there is a second well spent. Sometimes patience pays off. And if the worst case scenario is you get to spend some time in the outdoors in, you know, in an area where, where this bird's at, well, that's time well spent. So be patient. I love it. I love it. I think that is sage advice. Well, thank you, doctor. Thank you, Mike. And yeah, man, I'm Todd. 